Welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar. This one is on global and domestic pulse market update. My name is Claire and I work with the Birchop Cropping Group. I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability. Now I'd like to introduce you all today to Nick Goddard and Phil Bowden from Pulse Australia. Nick is the Joint CEO of Pulse Australia and AOF, Australian Oil Seeds Foundation. Both organisations are whole of value chain bodies representing the respective industries both locally and internationally. Nick has a long and successful career in the food industry, working for end user portion of the agricultural value chain with companies such as Goodman Fielder and Unilever. Phil is a Pulse agronomist with Pulse Australia and is based in Cootamundra. And prior to this work, he has worked for New South Wales DPI for the past 30 years. Phil has a strong interest in the Pulse industry so the purpose of today's webinar is to give you all an overview of a global and domestic pulse market update. Now, before we start the webinar, everybody will be muted. We will take questions after the presentations and the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen allows you to type questions in. So if you see the button for Q&A, click that, type your question into the box and then hit send. You can also send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to the question. The webinar is also being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, if you have technical issues or you would like to share this at a later stage, the recordings will all be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next <coughs> days. Now let's get straight into the presentation and I'll hand over to Nick first. Many thanks, Claire, and uh, good morning, everybody. A nice brisk morning where most of you are, I'm sure, um, with what looks like being a pretty good season all around, certainly for those in, in New South Wales. And if we've got any listeners in Queensland, a uh, much better state than we were this time last year. So what I'll run through today, if we can just go to the next slide, Claire. Um, between Phil and myself, we will cover the global pulse outlook. Just look at those main drivers. Uh, what, what is actually driving or shaping that, that um, environment? What are the prospects for the future? And then um, Phil will talk through on the domestic front what's happening uh, with, with the crops with a bit with a focus on the southern, southern region. So we might move straight into it. And it's pretty hard not to start any presentation these days without a discussion on COVID-19. And when we look at the majority of the markets that Australian pulses go to, they've certainly uh, been infected, uh, affected by, by the impacts of COVID, whether it's um, changes in demand or actual restrictions that have been placed on the ability to export to those countries. So I thought I'd just spend a moment or two and look at, look at our major markets and what the impact of COVID has been. Claire, if you wouldn't mind the next slide. And the next one, there we go. Um, so our major markets for our pulses, as you know, Egypt, Pakistan, Bangladesh and India in particular, you've been pretty familiar with these curves. You see them on the news many most nights of the week. And it does give a, an indication of where each of these countries is. Now, we could always say that, well, okay, the ability to, to record and test in some of these countries may not be as, as strong as it is, is in Australia, but even if that's 20% of the, of, of the potential being tested, it's the shape of the curve is really what we're looking at here. And if we look at Egypt, which is obviously our major market for favour beans, we're seeing that like most countries, they, they reached a peak a couple of months ago, but they've certainly, start, they've certainly come back down into a, a much more manageable state. Now, what that's meant for Egypt, when the pandemic started back in March, they put restrictions on exports and they tightened the currency very much to protect, um, protect the market. So with the exports um, from Egypt effectively banned, um, they had sufficient supply to carry them through this period. Uh, their supply or their demand was also tempered by the lack of eating out that, that experienced there. So the demand for favour beans fell back. Um, but things, things have now settled back to a more typical or normal position in Egypt. 
Um, if we just move on to Pakistan, again, oh, no, no, sorry, previous slide. <laughs> um, look on to Pakistan, we see that, again, they've had a similar sort of pattern and, and you know, I'm not sure what the extent of testing should be. I should just say those numbers in the top, in this case, 294,000 and 6.3 thousand, that's the number of cases in the first instance, 294,000 cases, and then 6,300 people have died. So just to put it in perspective. Um, but again, Pakistan coming back down to a, to a more manageable situation. So supply chain starting to come back into action. Pakistan, perhaps not as ordered uh, and centrally governed as Egypt. So they don't have that same capacity to test large amounts of the population um, that, that maybe that happened in Egypt, but nonetheless, it's an, it's an indication. Looking at Bangladesh, a slightly different um, position. And again, the ability to test and measure um, in terms of the numbers is, is difficult, but the shape there sort of indicates they've got a way to go. Um, and of course, in India, a major market, uh, when the borders are open at least, or when the tariffs are not there, uh, still has got some way to go. It looks like it's still climbing. It may have reached a peak, but when you look at the absolute numbers there, and even if they're out by 50%, they're still big numbers. So 3.1 million infections and 58,300 people um, have died as a result. And that's where we've probably seen and, and certainly heard most of the um, news about the impacts of COVID on, on the supply chain for pulses. Most of you or many of you would be aware that when the COVID uh, situation arose back in March and April, India went into a very hard lockdown but that really did disrupt the supply chains for food. And um, pretty quickly, the government realised that they would need to supply supplemental food to about 800 million people, so the poorest of the poor in India. And uh, so a lot of wheat, rice and pulses were pushed through that market to, to um, I guess, pump prime, prime, pump prime the, um, the supply chain with pulses. I'll get on to the specifics in each country shortly, but um, maybe we'll just move on to the next slide now. And, and um, But that was just a bit of a scene setter as to the way COVID has impacted those countries and their, their impact, the impact on, on pulses. Next slide, thanks, Claire. Of course, the other major impact for Australian um, trade with our number one market, India, is how the crops are performing. So the Rabi crop is the one that's harvested around April, May. <clears throat> and that was just as, as the pandemic was really getting underway, excuse me. <clears throat> um, but they had a pretty good season, notwithstanding uh, the fact that they had some supply chain issues, they had a pretty good season. And demand for Desi chickpeas is around 8 million tonnes. And, and the estimates are that they produced maybe 8.5 million tonnes, which was, which was up on the previous year. So the, the outlook for chickpeas, the opportunity to export for chickpeas to India is not looking that bright. They still have a, 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 um, a very high tariff, 60% tariff in place, and no indication that will drop in the near future, given that they've got reasonable supplies at the moment. Um, and the government, there's a, there's a, there's a high MSP or, or minimum um, support price for, for growers, and uh, the government is likely to purchase more pulses. The government's been buying a lot of pulses from the market in India, to, um, to supply the population. And um, that's likely to fuel a strong planting coming into 2021. So they start planting just about when we start harvesting. So again, we can, we're expecting to see, subject to how the monsoons finish up, um, a pretty strong, um, what would be their winter cropping or the Rabi season at, over next year. <coughs> Um, you probably may be aware that there was a reduction in the tariff. So there was a tariff of 30% applied to lentils the last couple of years. That had a temporary um, reprieve up until the 31st of August, so up until next weekend. Sorry, this weekend. And um, that dropped the tariff back to 10%. So what that did, we saw a lot of the leftover lentils sitting in supply chains in Australia move out through that, which was good. Now, that is expected to finish at the end of this week. Um, will it? Well, we'll have to wait and see. It's, you never really can estimate with India whether, how, they, how they handle that. They'll um, make decisions without, without notice. If that does happen, it's probably not a great benefit to us. It will benefit Canada that's coming into their harvest now. Probably won't benefit us um, because unless it extends 
past way past our harvest and into December and January, we probably wouldn't be able to meet those that, that opportunity. The quota for peas remains. They have a 300,000 tonne quota on peas in uh, in India, and um, but the Karif crop, which is their summer crop, so that's uh, pigeon peas <clears throat> and um, mung beans, they are coming, could, could have an early harvest. Things are looking pretty promising there. And if it's an early harvest, that might lead to more lentil planting in India for, um, for the upcoming rabi season. Conscious of the time, Claire, so I'm just gonna keep moving on pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> in terms of fava, fava beans, there was a, a global shortage over the last couple of years. And uh, domestically, the, the drought in Australia, just gonna have a big cough. Great. Um, the domestic crop, a lot of that went towards uh, a feed in Australia. So globally, there was a shortage. But this, this, come, this current year's production of fava beans is looking pretty promising. Australia, and Phil will get onto those numbers, looking very good. The UK also looking good, and the Baltic states looking good. So um, probably more than a million tonnes will be in the global market, which, which is a lot of fava beans, particularly when the demand's about eight or 900,000. So excess of supply on the fava bean front. And next slide, thanks, Claire. And just looking at the Canadian crop very briefly, their lentil crop is looking very good. They're coming into harvest during September, and uh, they've had some, some recent heat waves come through as you've probably seen the bushfires and so on throughout uh, West Coast US. Um, that heat also pushes up into Canada, but that hasn't in, it's adversely impacted the crop too much. And um, there'll, there'll be a lot of lentils out of Canada this year, uh, red lentils. <clears throat> and if the Indian tariff reduction does continue past the 31st of August, well then Canada's well positioned to be able to capitalize on that. So next slide, thanks Claire. <clears throat> So just a quick look at those key drivers and really the bottom line for pulses for the next 12 months is that in all likelihood supply is going to be greater than demand. And uh, for hungry mouths, that's good because that means the prices will be lower and there'll be a bountiful supply of pulses, particularly in those countries hard hit by the pandemic. But I guess from our perspective, that means prices will be, will be tempered somewhat. Um, we won't be looking at, at record prices for the time being, but um, that sort of, the situation on a global perspective, just to just to outline what's shaping um, the market. So thanks for that, Claire, and back to you. <clears throat> Phil, back to you, Phil. Okay, thank you, Nick. Yeah, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, hope you're all well. Uh, listen, uh, I'm just going to give you a rundown on uh, where we're at. Um, with the, with this domestic uh, situation. So um, just a bit of history here. Um, you would uh, mostly be aware of our record pulse production back in um, 2015 and 16. Uh, we produced around uh, four and a half million tonnes of pulses that year and, and it coincided with record prices. So uh, we had 10% of the Australian grain production that year and it provided 25% of the dollar value. So we really had a change that year, although over those few years, many farmers had changes in attitude to growing pulses. There was lots of um, profitable um, pulse crops those few years. So, uh, and then the last few years, we've had pretty difficult conditions in a lot of the states. Um, the drought in, in the east, Queensland and um, northern New South Wales in particular, um, but uh, in general, you know, good seasons in somewhere somewhere around Australia, you know, particularly Victoria, um, South Australia, and Western Australia in some of those years. Um, so that also coincided with um, some research that many of you may well have participated in through the grower groups around Australia. Uh, it was led by John Kierkegaard uh, from CSIRO, but it showed the overall value of pulses in, um, in crop rotations. Um, so I've got a link there, which is the farm link uh, link from New South Wales. But if you uh, want to check out that research um, um, reports. They're probably on all your uh, farmer groups, yeah, MacKillop or um, Birchip, uh, were all participators. Um, so it really um, uh, made 
pulses um, come to the fore uh, it, and entrench them in rotations. Um, so either as a valuable break crop uh, for all uh, the issues, the weeds, diseases and pests, but also as a high value cash crop. Uh, a lot of those uh, pulses are being marketed in for human consumption now, not just stock feed. Uh, so next slide, please, Claire. Um, so just having a look uh, at what's happening um, around Australia at the moment. Um, so in Queensland, um, yeah, we had good rains in March and April, um, but it's dried off in a lot of those areas since. Um, central Queensland and parts of the Western Downs, you know, we're expected to have um, uh, greater chickpea plantings, but but that hasn't occurred. Um, so. Uh, in actual fact, um, we're expecting um, quite um, a limited crop there, probably much less than normal for um, for chickpeas in particular. Uh, New South Wales, though, on the other hand, has had um, good rains. You know, starting off after the fires and the um, the drought uh, in February, it pretty much much hasn't stopped raining uh, since, and the crops are really progressing well, uh, particularly those northern New South Wales and western areas with um, some excellent crops, um, chickpeas, fabers and, and lupins. Um, and also in the south too, it, it's extended down there. There's, there's quite large plantings of, um, of chickpeas and, and lupins and faber beans. Uh, and look, the predictions are for that the La Nina conditions will continue. Um, Similar in Victoria, yeah, they had a great start. Um, yeah, some areas were quite wet uh, and uh, sowing was delayed. Uh, the Mallee region has suffered a bit of a dry July and June, but you know, the late last few weeks, uh, we've had um, pretty good rain across lots of those areas. And, and similar in South Australia, um, yeah, there was a good start, but then uh, a dry period, but um, recent rains have um, given the crops a real boost. And Western Australia, it, it's a bit unknown at, um, across some of the areas there. They, had, they certainly had a patchy start, but uh, lately they've had a, had a few regular rainfall events that have um, pretty much re revived their season. Um, so next one, please, Claire. Um, yeah, so over the last um, month or so, uh, Pulse Australia have been putting together this um, crop forecast. Um, I'll just put, highlight a few things there. Um, so Queensland, uh, they'd probably normally have um, uh, probably nearly twice that area uh, in uh, for, in a normal year for chickpeas or in a in a in a, a large year for chickpeas. So you can see. Um, Chickpeas are the, are the dominant crop there. Um, and normally they would uh, have a greater production than New South Wales. Um, so you can see for chickpeas in particular, uh, most of the chickpeas, perhaps 60% are gonna come out of New South Wales this year. Uh, and, there's, and New South Wales certainly will uh, have some good yields. So our yield predictions for New South Wales are pretty good. Um, Victoria, you see, look, it's consistent right through for all the crops. Uh, it's going to be the powerhouse for um, for um, pulses this year, uh, pre pretty much um, right across the board. Um, increases in uh, chickpea and uh, faba beans in particular, uh, and um, the um, South Australia as well. Uh, I guess um, faber beans there are uh, predicted to be a pretty um, good crop. The lentils, you know, it's probably about average, uh, perhaps a little above average for the lentil crop. Um, and Western Australia, yeah, traditionally uh, the lupin um, uh, growing areas there, and um, uh, they're probably about average for that for that region. So just um, you can see the increases uh, from last year, uh, chickpeas in particular, uh, compared to last 
uh, few years that were drought affected in, in the eastern states. And uh, favour beans, um, they're, um, they're all up. Uh, field peas, are um, they're always a difficult one, but um, to predict, um, because a lot of them are still held on farm, um, they're not traded. Um, but and they're, and they're also used for other brown manure and green manure crops. Um, so look, we're predicting overall that um, compared to last year, that there'll be about 150% increase in the area um, of pulses in general. So last year was around 1.6 to 1.7 million tonnes traded. And this year up around uh, two and a half, uh, 2.6. So next one, please, Claire. So just going through the individual crops, um, I've got collected this uh, information uh, the last few days uh, from a range of our um, Pulse Australia members that, that tra are trading. Um, so lentils, yeah, uh, we're still getting demand from Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka and, and India, um, mostly old crops and it, it's uh, priced around 680. Um, as Nick mentioned though, I guess there's uh, the uh, Canadian crop coming in and, and probably some of the Euro uh, Eastern European crops coming in pretty soon. Um, we find that a crop, an Aussie crop size around 350 to 500 is quite marketable without much problem, but um, we may well have more th this year. Um, We've got a niche market there for um, for nuggets and nippo um, in the subcontinent, um, and um, so currently there's quite um, good demand, um, and the prices probably for the new crop are, are going to be a little bit down on what we're seeing at the moment for the old crop, but uh, still pretty good. We have a uh, cost of production of around 400 to $450 a hectare. So a yield of, um, you know, one to 1 1.5 um, uh, tonnes, uh, which is pretty average, you know, will give um, some um, good um, gross margins there. Uh, chickpeas, yeah, we've got pretty uh, flat demand at the moment. So only Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, have been interested uh, at around 500 to 550. Uh, new crop has a premium at the moment for early delivery, which would be um, uh, probably September, which is normally coming out of central Queensland, uh, up to $680. But uh, the prospects of a larger crop will probably lower the prices. Um, and favour beans, yeah, demand has dropped. Um, the pretty much the, all the old crops been sold. It went into uh, Egypt and the Middle East, um, mostly for um, uh, feasting around Ramadan. But yeah, it was affected, as Nick said, by the closure of a lot of their um, outdoor markets, and um, and we'll be seeing a bigger crop here. So we're predicting um, that the prices will drop. Um, around 450 to uh, 400 to 450, um, possibly be used uh, a lot more for stock feed. And then there's a new protein extract plant that's going in at Horsham that might take a bit, put a bit of a floor in the market. So yeah, good crops uh, of favour beans uh, in many areas, northern New South Wales and Victoria in particular. Um, most of the northern uh, New South Wales crops will probably be cashed. You know, those growers haven't had crops for a couple of years to sell. So uh, we predict that they'd be sold pretty much at harvest, but the Victorian and South Australian growers may well be hanging on. Uh, so next one, please, Claire. I've got a couple of um, slides of um, uh, chickpeas here. Uh, this is comparing a Queensland sample on the left with a um, southern New South Wales sample. There are premiums, you know, for um, colour and size. Um, so visual quality is very important, you know, particularly for our main market at the moment at, in Bangladesh. Um, they like a lighter, uh, larger um, desi chickpea. And again, they're mainly consumed during Ramadan, but 
you can see there that um, the southern New South Wales samples are often quite different to what we, we get out of Queensland. Uh, so next one, please, Claire. And also on to favour bean quality, there tends to be um, pretty much cliff face pricing here. The, the um, demand for human consumption uh, is um, very particular. So they're wanting light, even colour, uh, like we see on the left. Uh, in storage, favour beans can discolour quite quickly. And um, you know, that sample, um, uneven, dark, uh, defective really um, in some form uh, will have a much lower price. Uh, so on to the next one, please, Claire. Uh, so just on to lupins and field peas. Yeah, Albus lupins. Yeah, they have been in pretty short supply. They were mainly a New South Wales um, and Victoria crop, I guess. Uh, not too many produced um, because of uh, disease in Western Australia. Uh, they've been in short supply and demand has been quite high. Uh, and they were sold uh, for human uh, consumption into Egypt, uh, but they're mostly sold out. So we're waiting on the new crop. Uh, there will be um, quite uh, good demand for them at around 500 to 550. Uh, used both in the stock food industry and for human consumption. Uh, similar, I guess, with uh, narrow leaf lupins, um, there'll be a pretty good crop here in New South Wales and Victoria, um, and certainly demand for stock feed and aquaculture industry um, is using those. Um, so the prices may drop as the crop comes in. And field peas, yeah, the, uh, I'm told that there's sort of not much trading at the moment. Um, it's very quiet. Um, Canada has a good crop and I guess we'd be competing with them at the moment. Um, and, you know, typically with field peas, uh, many farmers just elect to keep them on farm. Um, they're not even tr not traded. Um, so that we probably don't see a lot of those anyway, but around 4.20 um, at the moment, uh, if there is trades, but um, more likely um, that price may drop uh, further with the new crop. Uh, next one, please, Claire. So we've also got three questions that have come in. Oh, okay, yep, good. Um, so look, um, we're thinking the future does look good. Um, we've certainly got greater consumer interest uh, in a lot of new products. Um, uh, Pulse Australia has done a report, Raising the Pulse, which is available on our um, Pulse Australia website. Uh, it's on the front page, um, which gives a very positive outlook for the next decade for pulses. Um, we've also got a, um, a facility uh, based at Charles Sturt Uni at Wagga, the Functional Grain Centre, uh, run by Chris Blanchard. Um, about, and and it, that has a lot of uh, latest research into value adding. Uh, lots of good prospects for aquaculture in Asia, uh, particularly lupins and faba beans. Um, and the high stock prices too. It'll be interesting to see how they go with the uh, lockdowns in many um, countries. But, um, and certainly the Middle East and India, uh, Asia, uh, all our neighbours really um, have all got high potential to take um, these crops. Uh, so we, we gathered this information. Um, if you go to the next slide, please, Claire. Yep, thank you. So, um, yeah, we had um, uh, consulting with a few of our grain traders to put all this information together. So we thank them very much. Um, and I'll hand it over to you, Claire. If we've got a few questions, Nick and I are both still here to take them. Okay, so Phil, are you forecasting favour bean yields of two tonne per hectare? plus verse lentils back at 1.4 tonnes per hectare. This seems a bit out of balance. Can you comment? 
Uh, yeah, look, some of the, uh, I guess we are predicting higher yields. There's ho there's higher yield potential for faba beans anyway, and especially, uh, you know, New South Wales, uh, Victoria and, and South Australia have got good faba bean crops, uh, not being affected by too much disease. And, you know, the, uh, we, we know in a lot of the trials that the, yield potential can go up to four or five tonne uh, per hectare for faba beans and they're looking very good at the moment. Uh, so yeah, we have got a bit of a higher um, um, yield prediction for faba beans. Lentils, um, I mean, they, they can go uh, higher than 1.5, but um, I, just, I guess we're just waiting to see what will happen with disease pressure on a lot of those crops. Um, probably 1.5 to 2 tonne is, would be an average yield um, or average to good yield for a lentil crop. So, Thank you, Phil. And um, we've got another question now, which could be either of you. It's, will there be any premium for Kabulie over Desi chickpeas? Uh, I can, I'll take that one, Claire. Yeah, look, I don't think there is at the moment. Um, our markets are quite limited where they're going into and from the, the information we get from the traders that there, there isn't much of a premium this year, um, which is quite unusual. Um, and the next question we've got is, will mung beans be under the same COVID-19 effect? That uh, yeah, that's... Uh, sorry, is that, the, is that, have you got more of that question? No, that's it, that for that question. Oh, okay. Um, look, mung beans are an interesting one. Um, we've had um, a crop, I think it was around um, 150,000 tonnes maybe this year um, and at record prices. And a lot of that was sold into China. So, uh, at, which was quite an anomaly when they were um, reducing their um, barley uh, imports. They took every every bit of our uh, mung bean crop, I think. So we've actually got um, Paul McIntosh, I think, is on our um, feed today. He would have a better idea of it than, than I do, but um, uh, the prospects for mung beans are excellent. So. Um, was there any other last minute questions from anyone that they wanted to quickly type in? Uh, yes, how soon will the UK and the Baltic favours be harvested? <clears throat> yep, they're just um, coming into harvest round about now. So they'll, they'll certainly hit the market before the Australian uh, fibre beans do. Yep. Okay, thanks Nick. Um, there's no more, but I'll just have a little spiel at the end and keep an eye on the question box. So thank you very much, Nick and Phil. Um, if anyone is looking for further information on um, pulses, GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. Also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project has a number of activities occurring during 2020 to bring you the latest information. Most of these are in an online format. Uh, we also have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia. So if you have any other suggestions or requests for information that you'd like to learn about pulses, please uh, let me know. My best contact for myself is email claire at bcg.org.au and keep an eye out for future webinars. There will be a webinar in the month of September as well. I've just got a comment. Uh, so couple of comments come in. Uh, yes, mung beans in 2020 slash 21 summer are getting a lot of attention from down south. Another comment, good indications of strong pricing for mung beans in 2021. Thank you. That's probably come from our colleague Paul in Toowoomba. Yes, um, yeah, so I might add um, to um, clear that um, yeah we've got a, um, some extensive in information on Pulse Australia website as well. Um, 
we've just updated our uh, fungicide um, uh, program there that you know all the registered um, products um, and um, permits that can be used um, on, on all the pulse crops so um, uh, yeah that's part of our um, uh, pulse stewardship program that we run through GRDC. Terrific, thank you for that, Phil. I um, haven't seen any more questions come in. So yeah, thank you very much, Nick and Phil. Once everyone leaves the webinar, you will be redirected to a screen with a very quick survey link. It has five questions and should take no more than a minute just to see how you found today uh, so that we can try and improve the future webinars for you. Um, as I said earlier, if you have any suggestions or you'd like to be kept in the loop of when these webinars occur, please don't hesitate to contact myself. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Nick. Very good. Thank you for having us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. Have a great day.